In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of the Schrodinger model of the atom by talking about the model itself. Just a quick rundown of the learning objectives of this video. Uh, we're going to start with the review of part one. If you recall in part one, we talked a lot about the problems with the Bohr model and then why that led to a new model being created. We're then going to get into the scientist responsible for this model, Erwin Schrodinger. We'll provide a little background history on who he was. Uh, and then finally, we'll focus on the model itself. We'll talk about how the Schrodinger model uh, modified the Bohr model to include new science, uh, how the Schrodinger model kind of hinges around this concept of the wave equation. That's really what Schrodinger created. Uh, and then finally, how this wave equation creates for us a new picture for what an atom actually looks like. And if you recall, that was the fundamental flaw with the Bohr model, was that it didn't create a picture. If you take a look at the right side of our screen, this diagram here kind of gives us an overview of the entire process of going from the Bohr model over to the Schrodinger model. On the left here we have our Bohr atom, and then we can see that Bohr atom separated into its distinct energy levels that allow electrons to jump in between. Over here we can see the Schrodinger model itself, and what we can actually see is that these levels get divided into multiple sublevels, uh, and end up getting a much more complex and a much more detailed picture of what's actually going on with energy levels inside of the atom. And this is the process we're going to be working on over the next week or so uh, in terms of understanding how we went from this very simple picture of the atom to a much more complex yet much more accurate picture. As we already said, let's start this process by doing a quick review of video one. If the stuff we're about to talk about doesn't make sense, you should take some time and review video one to provide a little more context for why this model was necessary. First of all, we identified the fact that the Bohr model, while it had its merits, had some new theories come down the pike that conflicted with it, those of which being wave-particle duality in 1923 and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in 1927. With the advent of these two theories, uh, scientists realized very quickly that there were problems with the picture of the atom depicted by Bohr. They therefore decided that a new model was necessary in order to encapsulate these new ideas and create a better picture of at atomic behavior. Uh, and that new model, whatever it would end up being, and whoever came up with it would need to replace those rings with probability functions because we decided based on Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, this guy right here, that we can't place electrons in rings. Likewise, this new model would have to treat the electron both as a wave and as a particle uh, simultaneously, and that's due to wave-particle duality, which is determined by de Broglie-Liais. Um, so these two things combined, plus all the stuff from Bohr, is going to create the new picture of the atom uh, that is necessary. Again, if this is unclear, go back, watch the part one video again, and then come back and check and look at this stuff a second time. So before we dive into the model itself, let's take a minute and talk about the scientist Erwin Schrödinger. Uh, Erwin Schrödinger was born August 12, 1887. He is an Austrian physicist who specialized and did most of his work in the fields of quantum mechanics. Although, as with many scientists, in the later part of his career, he did venture out into some other branches. Uh, most of his research focused on the development of the wave equation, which we'll be talking about shortly. That's his new model. Uh, and he also spent a lot of time working on a type of mathematics known as matrix mechanics. Uh, it's a way of approaching uh, quantum dynamics calculation using matrices, uh, which allowed Schrodinger to get at a lot of solutions and answers that other physicists were incapable of. This eventually became one of the quintessential mathematical approaches to tackling a lot of these types of problems. As I already mentioned, later in his career, he did venture off into other sciences. He tried to apply his quantum dynamics understanding to a couple other branches. And just to give you an idea, thermodynamics was something he dabbled with a little bit. Uh, Einstein's general relativity he played around with, and he even made a few attempts at coming up with a unified field theory. Uh, if you're not familiar with this concept, it's basically a, a branch of physics that's trying to come up with one set of laws that explains everything in the universe. Uh, currently, even this day, uh, we're talking over 100 and something years later, we still don't don't have that unified field theory, but Schrodinger took a couple swings at it. As you might imagine, Erwin Schrodinger received a Nobel Prize for his work. Uh, that work primarily focused on these two concepts right here, the wave equation and uh, the matrix mechanics. And we can't talk about Erwin Schrodinger without talking about one of his famous analogies for trying to explain the concept of wave-particle duality uh, and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and that's the concept of Schrodinger's cat. Uh, this is an idea that shows up every now and then, uh, but very rarely gets explained in the proper detail. 
While I don't expect you to be able to discuss the Schrodinger's cat experiment uh, in any type of test, I think it's an interesting thought experiment to talk about. Uh, it's important to note before we start that there was no cat ever involved in this process. Uh, we'll talk about cats being alive versus dead in a moment. This is all an analogy, a thought experiment. So Schrodinger was trying to explain to some of his colleagues who were misinterpreting um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, trying to explain the concept of uh, uncertainty and more importantly the concept of superposition uh, as related by by um, wave-particle duality. And basically the way his analogy went here is we had a box. This box would be sealed. Inside the box you would have a radioactive source that would be randomly emitting radioactive particles. Those radioactive particles be, could be detected by this device over here, which is a switch, and if it detects those radioactive particles, it drops the switch, drops a hammer, breaks a glass vial containing a horrible, horrible poison, which would then kill the cat. Now, he, that's the setup. If the actual discussion, the analogy talks about here, if this box is sealed, then realistically you do not know whether the radiation has been emitted and the vial has been broken and the cat has died, or whether this has not occurred yet. As a result, the cat could be alive or the cat could be dead. If you were to describe the cat then in a quantum mechanics scenario, you would have to describe it as both simultaneously, the concept of superposition. In this scenario, the cat is both alive and dead, and there's a probability function that you could create to describe the cat in both scenarios. Now, if you were then to take a moment and open the box, you would then collapse the probability function. We no longer have a probability. We know that the cat is either alive or is dead through the direct observation. This was an analogy that he used to try to explain the concept of superposition in, say, for example, the double slit experiment. We saw a video earlier that showed that the electron travels through both slits simultaneously because the electron is really being portrayed as a probability wave. Uh, however, when you try and observe it, the probability part of the function collapses and the electron travels through one, way, one slit or the other. Same thing with the cat. The cat is in both conditions, alive and dead, uh, in superposition until you open the box. Then the probability function collapses and the cat has to be either one or the other. Again, not something I'm expected to hold you responsible for, but it's hard to talk about Schrodinger without also mentioning his feline friend. Let's move now into the actual model itself, and this is where you need to be, um, need to be recording this information and comfortable with what we're talking about. The new model took a couple different things in consideration. First of all, he took all the best pieces of Bohr. There were parts of the Bohr model that worked. There were parts of the Bohr model that matched up with what we saw in the laboratory, and Schrodinger kept that stuff. Schrodinger also had to fold in the concept of wave-particle duality. When you're working with this equation that he's about to create, he had to have part of the equation treat the electron as a wave, and then another part of the equation treat the electron as a particle to get the full picture of what an electron can do. This new equation also had to consider Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and it had to describe the electron's location very carefully. We can't say where an electron is according to Heisenberg, but we can predict where it is likely to be at any given point in time using a probability function. And that's really what the wave equation is, is a big probability function. All of this stuff got folded into a, an equation, not a picture. And I think this is one of the most clever things that Schrodinger actually did. Other scientists created their picture first and then built um, an equations to match it. Schrodinger basically said, I have no idea what an atom really looks like, but I understand the math that I believe describes it. I can put that math together and then that equation will generate a picture for me. And that's going to remove a lot of his bias from the actual creation of the model that he had. So to start us off on this next slide, this is a picture of one of the versions of the uh, Schrodinger wave equation. Now to be specific, the actual wave equation itself is this function right here, this phi of t function. And you can see it shows up in two different places in our actual uh, process of the calculation here. All the rest of this stuff is all the crazy math you have to do to work with it. This h of t thing is known as a Hamiltonian operator. Uh, it's a very complex math operator that changes the outcome of a function itself. And this stuff here is some differential calculus that you would need to be working with. Uh, I'll throw in some imaginary numbers and some Planck's constant and you can start working with these calculations. The short answer to all of this stuff is that this is very complicated mathematics, calculus and beyond, and it is not the kind of thing that I expect you to work with. However, 
we can look at this equation and treat it as a function. And if we think about it as a function, we can understand that it behaves the same as any other function in the sense that it's going to have an input and an output. We'll put data in and we'll get an output out. The data we put in is data concerning the behavior of the electron itself. These are going to come in the form of things known as quantum numbers. And then what we get out is this three-dimensional shapes and these three-dimensional shapes show us the probable location of a particular electron so when we put data about a particular electron into the function it gives us a three-dimensional shape out as to where that function will be and as you can imagine this shape combined with others is going to start generating a picture of what an atom actually looks like so just to kind of like maybe make this a little more graphical, don't think about the Schrodinger wave equation as complicated mathematics, just think of it as a function. And I think you've seen in your math classes this kind of notation before, where you have your function as some sort of machine that crunches numbers. You can input information into that function, and this is basically data about our electron. And then the function crunches numbers in however mathematical process it does. And then it spits out a three-dimensional shape that shows us the location that that electron would likely have around our nucleus. And that's really the way you want to think of the Schrodinger wave equation as a function that takes data in and spits out a three-dimensional shape that gives us a picture of the atom. So let's talk about these 3D shapes a little bit. Uh, they are the solutions of the wave equation. You plug in numbers for each individual electron and the equation spits out its own unique solution. These solutions represent where an electron exists 95% of the time. Only 95%. The other 5%, we have no idea where the electron is. It could be on the other side of the atom. It could be on the other side of the universe. And this is basically Schrodinger's way of keeping track or basically paying his homage to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It tells us we can't always know where the electron is. Now the question that this really begs though is the fact that the electron could be on the other side of the universe for that fraction of a second and then back in the atom again, is that what's really happening? Or is that a product of the fact that the model itself is not yet complete? And scientists don't necessarily have a great answer to that question yet. Now another thing that changes here is these 3D shapes are going to replace the rings. So we're not going to think about rings in the atom anymore. These shapes have a name. They are known as orbitals. And that's the terminology we're going to be using for the rest of this unit. The neat thing about this uh, situation is that we only get four general types of solutions. And again, those solutions are referred to as our orbitals. Four different shapes, and they are labeled with letters. We get S-type orbitals, P-type orbitals, D-type orbitals, and F-type orbitals. And basically, these are four different groups of answers that we get. And this is actually great news. When you have complicated chemistry going on, when you have complicated mathematics going on, and all of it boils down to four different types of answers, that's a good indication that something good is happening with your, with your model, with the process you're going through. Now, the next thing you might be wanting to know is what do these actual shapes or what do these solutions actually look like? And that's something we're actually going to save for class. I'm going to have you guys go on a little mission during class and figure those shapes out. But just keep in mind that each letter group has its own characteristic shape that goes along with it, which is why they're separated into these four categories. The last thing I want to show you before we wrap this up is the idea of an energy level diagram again. Uh, over here on the left side of the screen, we have a diagram of two different types of atoms. On the left, we have an atom depicted with the Bohr model, and on the right, we have an atom picting, uh, depicted with the Schrodinger model. And what you can see happens here is the original rings of the Bohr model, these are our rings, start getting subdivided into orbitals. What used to be ring 1 turned into orbital 1s. What used to be ring 2 split into an s orbital and a p orbital. Ring 3 splits into an s, a p, and a d, etc., etc., etc. And we start getting a much more detailed energy level diagram than we used to have with the Bohr model. Now, I don't necessarily need you to copy this image down right now. This is something we'll talk about more later in the, uh, in the unit. I just want to show you this, how the Bohr model is being modified 
modified or improved to turn into a Schrodinger model with orbitals instead of rings. Just a quick jot down what you should get is the ideas we just talked about. The fact that the orbitals themselves represent the subdivisions of the Bohr model energy levels. That each original ring in the Bohr model breaks into one or more sublevels or one or more orbitals. And that finally we get a more distinct or a more detailed energy level diagram of an atom that is capable of explaining spectroscopy jumps that we might have seen in our spectrometer but couldn't necessarily have explained using the Bohr model itself. There are so many more gaps over on this side of the model for electrons to jump between you can imagine this would create more and more lines that just couldn't be accounted for with these four very simple rings we had over here. So to wrap things up then a quick list of the things you should be able to do you should be able to describe the wave equation as a function not the math specifically but the concept of inputs versus outputs I put data about the electron in I get 3d orbitals out. Uh, you should be able to describe the new shape of the atom in terms of orbitals, and this is something we're going to build more in the class. When you see the pictures of the orbitals, this discussion will make a little bit more sense. And then finally, you can, should be able to discuss how the original structure of the Bohr model was modified with Schrodinger's concept of orbitals and how we went from the simple rings energy level diagram over to a much more complex, much more detailed energy level diagram with our orbitals. All of this is stuff that we'll develop further in class, and all of this, especially the orbital stuff we talked about last, is things we'll talk about more in future videos, and you guys will eventually fold this into new electron configurations that you can build using the Schrodinger model as opposed to the much simpler Bohr model.